So I understand, and I just I, I've heard that there are a couple of new. Yep, I've heard there are a couple of new itineraries, um, particularly along the pack rim. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you'll share anything with us because these one in particular had a. I'm a history buff in a way, and there's a, a kind of a World War II component to it. If I if my sources are any good. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you got good sources there, Stuart. Oh. Um, so yeah. So the the National Geographic Resolution in 22, she's going to come down this brilliant arc through Japan, do a trip on the coast of Vietnam. Uh, no, she's not doing the Vietnam. She's coming down to Taipei, um, but she is going to take us from Taipei across to Papayete. So if you think this is going to be through Kiribati, um, Chuck, all the way down through all those little islands where you get the opportunity to understand the progression of the Pacific theater during World War II, but also just the cultural components and the underwater opportunities, right? Amazing snorkeling through these areas. But that's that's an itinerary that I don't even think is in our system yet. So all right, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll delay this. We'll delay this a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, we'll it's, it's a stunning. It's a stunning itinerary. I think for anyone who is is a real um, uh, has a real desire to learn more about that arc of the Pacific, um, and that's on the brand new ship. So that's going to be absolutely stunning. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And you're, I mean, you're on all seven continents. So yeah, World's Rooster with Lindblad. I mean, you know, and what is one of your What's one, not just your favorite, one that really is a, how do you ask this question? I want to ask basically what's underserved by others or really lacking, you know, maybe only big ships go and you're small. Um, yeah, look, um, that's a, it's a really interesting question uh, because so many of the places on the planet now you know, everyone is trying to get in there, right? So even when you think about something like the Northwest Passage, and let's use that as an example. Great the example. Northwest Passage, it's, it's such a renowned place. People have that on their list of things. It's like, I have to do, it's resolute in history and, you know, it's pioneers and they all want to do it. Um, and there are some bigger ships that go up there. I think one of the things that's really important when you're going to these really remote, remarkable places is if you're visiting small villages of 300 Think about how you want to see that village. Do you want to see it with maybe 100, 126 people or do you want to be coming in there with 500 people, 1,000 people? Is What is that cultural experience when you're more, there's more of you than there are of them? Um, you know, so there may be options in some of these places, but it's a very different outcome. Um, kind of my grandmother used to also say to me, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> Um, you know, I, 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 and I think that's an important thing to always think about, um, you know, because that intimacy of exploration, being with only a ship that has 69 cabins, when you're up there in the ice, you're alone, you are surrounded by ice and it, it, it's such a small intimate gathering of people. When you go into a small Inuit village, you know, you can take half the ship in and it's a very intimate cultural exchange. So is that how you want to see the world or do you want to see it just in a whole big cacophony of noise and sound and other people? And so I think in places like the Northwest Passage or the Northeast Passage over Russia, they're very good examples of that, that intimacy changes how we explore it. Um, I would also say something like the Amazon. We have a 28 guest ship on the Amazon. Delphine um, 2. Love the, the Delphine. Delphine 2. And I tell you what, if you've ever seen, it's my favourite movie. My kids still laugh at me because they think I've, I'm so old because I love this movie, but The African Queen, Humphrey Bogart. So when they're going down, I think it's the Zambezi, right, and they're just surrounded by foliage and the noise of the wildlife, that's what the Amazon is. When you're up in the Pukai Samiria Reserve and you're way up in these little tributaries, that's the Amazon. It's not the big wide, big wide river. That's great, but that's not once again that intimacy of the experience that you can get up into these little regions and see how people truly use this river as a way they get to and from work or school. I mean, it's the lifeblood for them. I think about it like the Venetian experience, where you know you, you see the little boats going through those little channels and that's how they get to and from market yeah. and, and such. It's, you got to get close in there. The big ones don't do it. You're, I yeah. completely agree. And yeah. one thing just to reinforce your statement, we've had guests who go to cruises on the big ones in um, Greece 
Mykonos Santorini, major hotspots, got to see yeah. it, you know, every Instagram type picture or whatever. We've had guests not been able to get on land on their cruise because three or four other boats are there. It's too crowded. Yeah. So just remember that that's the over tourism angle that that kills people. It's it, thinking about it on a, a different scale with the Inuit. It's so much nicer to go with a hundred people than five, six hundred people. Yeah. I mean, it is just, it's it wouldn't feel the same. It just wouldn't. So and I, and I gotta, you just I opened it. You kind of opened a door for me there about Greece, right? We actually utilize the sea cloud. Marjorie Merriweather posts stunning sailing ship. Um, you know, Fifty-eight guests in the Greek Isles or the Dalmatian coast. I mean, that's. You know, sitting back and hearing the creaking overhead of those sails and arriving into a small port that the bigger ships can't get to, that's what expedition travel, that's one of the hallmarks, that little quiet places and the opportunity. Alaska with 100 people. We really, I used to... I used to say we avoid other people like the plague. Probably wasn't a good thing to be saying at that time. It's probably worse now, but... Um, <laughs> but so true. <laughs> but we do, right? You get up to Alaska and you're in these tiny, tiny little areas where you're surrounded by otters with their young on their chest and there's a bear foraging over here and there's so many bald eagles in the tree. They look like Christmas ornaments. And then you come out into the main channel and there's 3,000 person ship and a 4,000. And look, I'm not saying that that's a bad way to travel. Everyone has the, what they want to do. But if you have an opportunity to be hidden away for your entire week in Alaska and avoiding people and seeing what Alaska is about, which is the bear and the 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 the, the uh, amazing uh, marine life, because we have those divers in the water, it's a very different place. Hmm. So, I mean, I wish I could just grab people by the shoulders and go, you really need to see it up close, um, particularly Alaska, because it's just Here's so one way. Here's one way we could grab them, because we can't grab them. We can grab them virtually. <laughs> the sea cloud, to me, is very similar. If you've seen Russell Crowe's Master and Commander, which is an awesome <laughs> trip through the Galapagos on a ship just like that, two of your cabins on the sea cloud have wood-burning fireplaces in them. They're unbelievable. And... <laughs> If you yeah. want to take that step back in time, we've had some clients do the luxury rail experiences, yeah. you know, the Golden Eagle and the Royal Scotsman and such. If you have a client that wants to travel that golden era, that's a killer way. So you might get it in your head. Watch Russell Crowe's Master and Commander, yeah. great movie about the Galapagos, and you'll kind of get that sea cloud feel. And I, yeah. I think you guys bring that. Yeah, that Marjorie, might, might Marjorie the Post loved her opulence. I mean, there's those wood burning fireplaces on a wooden schooner, but it's it's gold and you know, beautiful gold taps. And I mean, it's just it's beyond. And so you if you really want to step back, as you said, that's that's the ship to do it on. But that, you know, we, we're also on the Nile. Uh, we have the Oberoi filet, which we utilize in the Nile, which is is brilliant. But so all seven continents, there's always these really cool ways to get out and explore. But certainly those two new ships that do the polar regions that we talked about. I mean, when you were first in, we were just getting those completed and the launch was coming and then COVID hit. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um but but they're just waiting, right? And we can't we can't wait to get people out on them because I think that it's just it's going to change the way that we explore certainly. But it's going to, it's going to it's a changer for the industry on that smaller size. We went smaller than bigger when we built these ships. Our biggest ship is 148 guests. Guests. We went to 126 with these guests. And the reason Sven and the team did that was because you know how quickly can you get people off a ship? And so you need to look at all those dynamics. If we see whales, we can't be waiting for ages to get people deployed and out. We want to have a number that allows us to do all those things quickly, efficiently, and get our, get our clients, your clients, out to explore. So we actually went smaller. You know, and you'll be, you'll be among explorers, which is important. Yeah. You're not going to be behind someone that doesn't really care, feels like they have to go. They're going to race you to the boat. You're not going to miss it because you'll be among the right people. So yeah. 